Nemenza always spoil me. My, my three favourite things in life are movies, fish and Egyptology. And last year they gave me the British Museum and this year they've given me an IMAX in an aquarium, which is awesome. Um, this is brilliant. I I'm really uh, grateful to Nemenza for having me and um, for being here with you guys today. So my name's Pete. Uh, I own a teeny tiny design consultancy. Um, technology company in London called Nexus. Uh, we're trying to do better things. So we um, set the company up a couple of years ago to look at design and technology in a slightly different way, in a slightly hum a more human way. Um, and we're doing some pretty foolish things. And I'm going to tell you a story today about some of the foolish things that we're doing and why I think design and collaboration should be uh, pretty foolish. Um, my career started in 96, and we've seen a huge amount of change during that period of time. So this is kind of my 20th year in industry. Um, it's an interesting space that we've all evolved and, and grown into because every couple of years things kind of change and technology changes us. And my first real thought about design for you today is not to follow shiny things, but to make sure you stick with what is happening at the moment. So we're using a lot of artificial intelligence at the moment in our, in our business to solve human problems, not because it's shiny, but because you know, if it's the thing at the moment, we can solve some really big issues with that thing. Um, and that's a piece of advice that I, would advi I, I, I think you should all take away is, you know, don't chase shiny things, but use shiny things to fix human problems. Um, the other thing that, that struck me about the last 20 years of my career is how much kind of stupidity we created. And um, technology scares me and humbles me and, and makes me curious in equal measures. Um, I have a feeling, you know, some days that we did this. Whoa, that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Like, we, th Jonathan. this is what we did with digital, right? So we kind of built no. the the metaphorical Sorry. escalator for a lot of people. Um, Somebody! <laughs> this video goes on for like 10 minutes, it's amazing. I'm not gonna there let you watch it. two people all. stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Yeah, well, digital's like an escalator. We built an escalator and um, I wrote this book and it got published recently um, and it's really a kind of very philosophical look at technology and the fact that we created this crutch that's kind of supporting people. And actually, if you stop and reframe technology and digital in a slightly different way, people might remember that they can walk upstairs and not expect it to kind of lift them up the stairs. Um, this is really interesting. Just a couple of stats before I plow into what we're going to talk about today. Time it took to reach 50 million people. Like radio, uh, 38 years. Angry Birds, 35 days. That's pretty awesome, right? And that is, that's incredible when you think about the power of technology and how quickly we can reach, we reach people. Um, Here's another really fascinating one as well. So Pope's inauguration, uh, 2005, 2013 in St. Pete's Square. Um, exactly the same space, exactly the same spot. Um, I mean, G well, not Jesus, Mary, isn't it? But the, like, if that's not another good indication of what technology has done to us over the last couple of decades, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what it is. As a business, though, uh, when I look at the kind of what I call the digital soul, I'm actually really interested in the bottom half. So as a designer now, what I'm really fascinated in is the data part. And we're going to do a couple of experiments during my talk today just to show you, I think, the awesome potential and power of that. If you have an iPhone, please stand up. This is going to go very well. Right, get your iPhones out. I want you to try and find that place in your phone, right? Don't, don't touch anything. Don't fiddle with any of the settings. I just want you to go through and find your um, diagnostics and usage data. Has everybody kind of roughly got it? Keep going. We've only got 30 minutes. When you find it, inside there are these little packets of data. That's your digital soul. So that's everything you've done in the last 24 hours on your phone, right? All those little packets of data, that's, that's basically you. Don't touch any settings. Now, just really quickly, like, I want you just to go back to the kind of, not into the data, but just up slightly. If you have don't send, switched on, sit down. So I'm looking for the portion of the room that have automatically send switched on. This has gone well. 
this is going better than I anticipated. Just look around. I think we're talking about you know, a quarter of the room who have automatically send switched on on their data. I want you to remember that. Now, please sit down. Thanks very much. We're going to use that later. I just want you to remember that. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quick, very quick look at today's digital man. Now, the reason I chose men is because I am a man and I can talk fluently about men. I still don't really understand the, the ladies in my life. Um, meet the lads. So we've got Dan, who's 21. We've got Abraham, who's 31. We've got Anish, who's, who's 21. My mate Ben, 25, and Alec, uh, Alex, who's 29. Uh, statistically, their lives pivot around their phones. We know this, we're all in digital 150 times a day, 177 minutes on their phone, pretty awesome. Um, they are probably checking social media before they've said good morning to their loved ones. Again, this is kind of behavior that is expected now, but kind of strange when you think about it. Um, and statistically, they're all spending sort of 80% of their time in five apps. One of those is, is a chat app now. So chat's become you know, a fairly <coughs> important piece of our design armory. Um, and that's kind of why we're making some of the decisions that we're making. Um, tragically, there's a virus in the UK at the moment that's killing like a lot of guys. Um, these guys who are generating all that data on their phones. Um, statistically, it's killing three times as many men as, as women. Nothing really adequately explains why. In 2015, these five guys all committed suicide. Um, in, 50, in 2015, they all took their lives. Uh, we said goodbye to these five guys, including my friend Ben. 117 suicides a day, seven out of 10 of those men. And all that stuff that's on your phone, all that, that data that's being generated, um, we decided that we'd try and use it to save some lives. And so I'm going to just talk to you really quickly about how we've designed and collaborated to try and design a solution to stop things like that happening to people like Ben again. So this remarkable young man here is a guy called Johnny Benjamin. Johnny Benjamin was part of a Channel 4 documentary called The Man on the Bridge. Um, he was fortunately for life um, talked down from a bridge in London when he was trying to commit suicide. And he had a chat to me earlier on in the year when we were both talking at a conference called Man Made. And he said, like, you know, do you think we could use technology and data to save people's lives? And I went home that evening and my wife said to me, you're not going to try and solve the problem, are you? And I went, I'm going to try and solve this problem. Um, and this is what we've done. I pivoted the business ever so slightly this year to try and look at all the brilliant technology and the data that we're, we're creating to, to save lives. Now, it would be incredibly bad for me to experiment on suicidal men. So we didn't do that. We experimented on a bank instead. Um, and that's also a, non, a, a piece of advice that I would give everybody is, you know, flip when you should flop or sort of zig when you should zag. Is, you know, there's always a way of getting data and there's always a way of designing a solution to a problem if you just look at a parallel problem. So we've been designing problems, solutions for kind of an industry that we can then reapply to uh, you know, mental health and things like that. And the last year, we've been working on a, a, a really wonderful project for one of the banks in the UK, um, creating a chatbot effectively. Now, what we were trying to do with the experiment um, was work out whether we could get human beings to talk about their problems with technology. We could design personalities effectively that, that people would want to talk to. And then reapply some of that to the issue of, of male suicide. I actually started the entire project by um, studying this movie. It's a really beautiful film. If you haven't seen the movie Her, you should just watch it. Like, it's awesome. It's about a man who's not very happy, and he forms a very deep and wonderful relationship with his technology. Um, we looked at that a lot, and we were saying, you know, that's the kind of experience that we would really like to, to, to create. Um, and again, that was... Uh, I'm interested in science fiction because I think science fiction is starting to become more like kind of science fact. And the movie Her, I thought, was a, was a really wonderful piece of research. And what a wonderful job we have when we can watch movies for research. Um, we started by trying to work out what support and help meant. Um, what's really wonderful, especially for men, is that you know, they don't necessarily need human support anymore. They just need something that's there. They need something that's kind of omnipresent and always on. Um, as, a, as, a, as a piece of thinking, you know, again, take that away. Sometimes people just need something that's there. They don't necessarily need human contact. Um, we kind of went all the way to China to try and solve some of these problems as well. Here's a really interesting case study um, from She's from been China. called a chatty teenager, a good listener, even a sympathetic friend. Can more than 20 million users in China be wrong? Well, that depends on whether it matters that she is a chatbot. 
an interactive computer program that learns about humans from mining the internet. Are you distressed to learn that so many people have apparently said to Xiao Ice, I love you? No, I think that's natural. I think the intimacy of the device is extended upon the software, that the relationship that we have with our technology now has a subject that embodies it. I think there's nothing wrong with us loving inanimate objects. Most children love stuffed animals when growing up. I think the... So, you know, it, it, it's interesting when you look at case studies. Like this. This is China's very conservative kind of country, and yet they're, they're, they're making huge inroads into... Um, research experimentation and looking at technology for supporting people really. Um, Show Ice we played with it. it was really interesting and we spent some time looking at how they created the personality of it. Now to create the personality for effectively an artificially intelligent thing you have to go back to the one thing that we all have which is humanity. Um, for the bank and then subsequently for the, the bot that we've been creating to support the suicidal men um, idea is you know, we, we spent a long time with people looking for the most human people that we could find. So with the bank, what we did is we interviewed 350 members of the front line um, across the organisation, just kind of drunk tea with them and had beers and just hung out and went to call centres. And we found one lady who, who just embodied everything that was brilliant about humanity and that brand in particular. And then we did exactly the same took exactly the same theory to the other project, to the side project for the suicide stuff. We, we spent time with this lady, Sarah. We realized that she was very much the kind of embodiment of support, um, empathy, humanity, and we codified her personality. So we ran her through you know, lots of psychometric tests, and we drew out all the things that made her brilliant and then imbued that into the personality of our bot. Um, and as a, th as a thinking mechanism, as a theory, that's really wonderful because it's kind of this, this very basic concept of human-focused digital, human-centered design, which is, you know, take somebody brilliant, some human being, take the best bits of them and put that into your project. Um, in the start of my career, I remember businesses used to say, like, take our brand guidelines and codify those. It's like, no, we can't do that anymore because they're created by marketeers, they're created by... Um, creative directors in kind of bu in bubbles and echo chambers. What we should be doing is taking people and imbuing what makes people brilliant inside our designs and our projects. So it's a good approach. Um, we created our bot. Um, we really were, we, we put it into a couple of different systems. We we got it out there just to see if people would actually react well to it. The personality side of it really shone through, and that was the first like big support tick that we got to, which was taking that human being and codifying them into the dialogues of this bot actually made a huge difference to the way that people reacted to stuff. Um, for us as a business though, what we're really interested in is the psychology. So this is a psychology experiment, not a technology experiment. And so again, this idea of tech solving problems, like tech is an enabler, it fills the cracks in, it doesn't build walls, like that's a good, good, good thing to think about as well. Um, would men really start to talk about their issues um, using about using technology? So yeah, so we studied the guys um, in particular using the bot that we created for the bank um, and also some of the, the, the bots that we created for um, the suicide and mental health stuff. And, and what we discovered is that when people um, do not think that they're talking to another human being, they actually engage in less impression management. So they cut through quite a lot of the BS and they get straight to their problems which is, again, a really wonderful thing. And I, I um, was very humbled to see some of the things that people would say when they did not think they were being judged by a human being. And technology, I think, has this, this wonderful ability to make us honest, make us honest. Um, again, it turns out that even in the banking scenario, people are, are much happier talking about you know, pretty much anything. So statistically, over 24 hours, you know, we had 1,078 requests, questions, conversations out of people that weren't even related to their banking. It's just people just asking the bot, like, you know, what's the weather like? Are you a man? Are you a female? Like, just general chit-chat. Um, people are weird. Like, they will chit-chat to technology. And this is all going into the, the piece of work that we, we've been creating to try and save some lives. Um, one quick quote, one piece of verbatim from a guy called David. Uh, it's really much better than talking to a human being. That's amazing. Um, and... What we were also doing in the background, and this is where I think collaboration with different parts of industry really start to come to fruition, collaboration with different companies as well. We did a lot of work with IBM Watson on this stuff. We bedded in a lot of um, sentiment analysis on those dialogues. We were really trying to grind out 
what makes people human, like in a technology-infused environment, what makes them um, adapt to the conversations that you're spewing out at them. Um, there's some really fascinating stuff going on in this space. We went to Israel and had a conversation with a company called Beyond Verbal. They create a platform called Emotional Analytics, which again feels sort of unethical, but you know it'll get more unethical later during my talk, so just brace yourself. Um, you, there, there's a different type of analytics, a very human type of analytics that is judging you, it's tracking you on you know, what you say, how you say it, what you do, your environment, those kind of things. And I think that kind of analytics into technology, into digital, is really going to start taking us to a much more interesting human space. Uh, like, I borrowed some rubbish from advertising as well. This is really unethical. There's a lot of systems out there at the moment that are effectively tracking your psychometrics um, online, your likes, and then trying to sell you stuff sort of subconsciously, so we nicked that. Like, I took that and I bastardized it and we put it inside our AI. So we used technology that was designed to sell people stuff and then we re-engineered it slightly to um, support people and start to feed people knowledge. This is really important as well, and this is one of my core design principles for the business. Um, it's in the book, we talk about it quite a lot, is Lewin's personality theory. So Lewin's personality theory is like your behavior is actually a function of your personality and your environment. That's really important, and mobile phones have given us the ability to track you know, where you are as, uh, uh, and the, the other factors that are going on around you, as well as you know, what you're saying and what you're doing. So we mapped in some really strange things over the top and underneath the conversations that we were having with the bot, like the news, the weather. Um, we were looking to see if people's behavior changed. In the last 48 hours, people's behavior has changed quite dramatically, as you can imagine, uh, now that that candy floss-haired knob is in the White House. Um, had to get it in there. Um, we spent some time with a really wonderful company called Firefly. Have a look at their app. Their app is really amazing. It uses the telematics on your phone, tracks where you go, what you do, and then starts to recommend other things that you might want to do as well. And again, this was about collaborating with other types of designers and other types of technologies. We've mapped all of this into the AI. We... Um, had a little play with voice biometrics. Voice biometrics is, is really interesting. Here's an app called Moody's that you can all play with. You get quite a lot from voice, um, obviously. And voice interfaces you know, are, are really interesting things. They're not quite there, in my opinion, but, you know, which is why we decided that we'd base our project on some of the, th the work that we're doing on chat, not voice for now, because I don't think it's quite there. But voice biometrics is really interesting. And so because we could, we were exploring lots and lots of different angles. Um, what we were really trying to do, though, was just prove the art of the possible. Um, we were trying to prove, we were trying to determine whether people would actually have a conversation. Now, it starts to get slightly unethical now, and you have to just bear with me. Um, if we could get people to talk, that's great. Um, but really, you need to get to people before they know they need help. And we spent a lot of time with... with um, various psychology groups and departments and charities and, and things, trying to work out the things that make people function before they do something. Um, I'm really humbled, actually. We, we spent some time with the families of some guys who'd committed suicide, who'd taken their own lives, and the family of my friend Ben, um, who graciously donated us his phone uh, that we went through, and we got his behaviour off his phone. So that stuff inside your phone that I showed you all, like we got quite a lot of this from that. Um, now, you don't have to be an expert in suicide to work out that Ben was going to take his life if you have that data. Um, and, you know, and it broke me up a little bit when we, we started to look at this stuff because you know, Apple collected that information and they were using it to try and sell him a shiny new phone. They didn't use it to try and save his life. Um, we, we also dissected the notes of those guys that I showed you earlier um, who did commit suicide and the notes of people that you know, unsuccessfully took their lives. And we ran them through basic social media uh, analytics tools and we collaborated with a social media company um, and we found one difference in the notes of the people that did and the notes of the people that, that threatened but didn't. One difference only, and that was sense of burden. So all of these guys were displaying a kind of exaggerated sense of burden. Um, what an incredible thing that we can start to use technology, collaborate with companies that exist outside of mental health and, and outside of you know, the suicide space to, to try and pick up on some of these things. Now, 
if, if I could use that data on your phone, maybe, hypothetically, I could find somebody who's really unhappy and help them before they know they need it. Um, hypothetically, if we were able to look at the Wi-Fi in the building today at your phones, hypothetically, you know, we could see that there's, you know, um, that our algorithm, Sue, you know, knows that there's a bunch of ladies, Emily and Melissa and Sophie and Alice and things. You know, hypothetically, if we were able to look at the Wi-Fi, they would find out that we're probably the most unmulticultural bunch of designers in the world. Like, this is a, it's like the Last Supper. Look at this. It's, um, it's remarkable. You know, and hypothetically, if we did hack the Wi-Fi and we were able to look at your phones, that we would be able to see that there were, you know, six different universities in the room and somebody from the Charity Commission and a crowded cat and an investment and pensions provider in the room. You know, hypothetically, if I was able to look at that information on your phone, then I would be able to determine people's careers. Hypothetically speaking, I would be able to determine, you know, in real time, the kind of social media that you're giving the world, um, and therefore perhaps some sentiment that has been, you know, pushed through those social media tweets. Our algorithm, Sue, just gives up with LinkedIn, which I think is fairly symptomatic of social media, if I'm honest. Like, <laughs> she just doesn't get it. Um, you know, hypothetically speaking, if we did look at that data on your phone that you were automatically sending to Apple, um, we might find that somebody, some people in the room, you know, display an over-exaggerated sense of burden. We, we, we could use the technology that's already out there to look at that stuff. Um, and then, you know, hypothetically speaking, we wouldn't do this because it's highly unethical, obviously. You know, we could probably determine that, you know, if someone in, there, in the room was a, a, a risk to themselves based on that information, 21% certainty is not high enough for us to do anything about it. But, you know, what if we had hypothetically looked at that information on your phones in real time and we could tell that that person, those people, were 93% likely to be a man? Um, now, I'm obviously not allowed to do that. Um, I would never do that. Um, but I just want you for a minute just to have a little think that the person sitting next to you is a human being. Um, the person sitting next to you who hypothetically might be going through a pretty dark time probably just needs a cuddle. And technology could probably just give us the ability to give someone a cuddle. And um, I think that's pretty awesome. And that's really all we're trying to do, you know, with the tech that we're building. Um, now, you know, if I was to install hypothetically something like that into the Wi-Fi on Oxford Street in London, like, I could probably save quite a lot of lives. Um, but just to close, you know, we're, we're not allowed to do that. It ethically challenges me because of, you know, the dangers of big data and things like that. So if I could use that information on your phone to effectively execute chat, a chatbot, like a week before you pull the trigger or hit the front of the 720 to Windsor, like, that would be pretty awesome. But, you know, legally, it's a, it's a minefield. Ethically, it's a minefield. We're not allowed to do it. There's this big thing going on in America at the moment. There's a lot of um, big data uh, uh, arguments and analysis going on. I'm not sure what's going to happen now, but um, I imagine surveillance is about to go up a notch. But, you know, um, I'm married to a human rights lawyer, so I do not take this stuff flippantly. I do not do this stuff because I think it's funny or cool. I do it because I think we can save lives with technology. Um, we've debated a lot in my house about the ethics of this. I don't think I can do it because of this concept of the panopticon. It is surveillance. I have to survey every single person in the room using technology and design in order to do what I'm talking about doing. Um, so morally, I think it's a very dangerous space that we start to play in. I'm just going to finish with two charts uh, that make me really cross and really angry, and then I'm going to leave you with something that I hope makes you smile. Um, and the reason that I am going to do this anyway, and I'm probably going to go to prison at some point um, for doing this, um, and I mean that, and I think you know, lives are worth going to prison for, um, the paradox of this technical revolution that we've created. So you know, we are in a largely people-powered society at the moment. The Samaritans and SOS and things like that, they do an incredible job powered by people to reach a small group of, uh, of individuals at, at risk to themselves. As you go across to this kind of Orwellian view of the world, um, you know, the, 
the, the AI, the technology that we create, the designs that we create, the sphere goes out. It gets really big, but it gets incredibly unethical. Now, I'm not allowed to use big data ethically to go to that Orwellian side, because that would make everybody feel uncomfortable. I'm these businesses are allowed to use it and are not under scrutiny from the US government or anyone else for the use of this kind of technology. Now, the third of you in the room, the court of you in the room, if you remember, who had automatically send, switched on their data, you've been sending that information to Tim Cook anyway. He's been collecting that information on you anyway. He's not using it to save your life. He's using it to sell you shiny stuff. I'm not allowed to use it to save your life. So, you know, who's unethical in this conversation? Not me. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to leave you this video. This is why we're doing this. This is why I'm going to do it. This is probably why I'm going to go to prison. This is why I think design is awesome. This is why I think we should be more human with our design. Um, I think you have to be a fool to change the world. To Step in the right direction It's hard To believe But it feels Like a step in the right direction So be brave design paradigm that we should all entirely work to, like stop doing things that don't really matter and you know, using all the wonderful talent that you have, stop doing better things. Um, I am going to do some of the stuff that we've just talked about. I am going to release some of the technology that we've been creating, collaborating with all these wonderful people, um, basically because I am a fool. Thank you very much. <laughs>